Hi, this is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Katherine Ellison, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of the new book, ADHD, What Everyone Needs to Know. So Catherine, can we talk a little bit about the myths of ADHD? Because I know there are a lot of parents who are, you know, affected by it directly and those who are affected by it indirectly, i.e. maybe a, a friend of one of their children or a classmate. And I want to get really clear about what is true and what isn't true about ADHD. So how can you help us out here? I think the most dangerous myth about ADHD is that it doesn't exist. And you will hear that and read that a lot. If you go on the internet, you'll find whole books. I think there's a whole book called ADHD Doesn't Exist. Whoa. <laughs> For some reason, why is this disorder more controversial than diabetes or heart conditions? But it is. It's, it's a medical neurobiological disorder that people say doesn't exist. And I sometimes think it's on par with the deniers of climate change because there's a lot of politics in it. Some people just don't like the psychiatric industry. Some people accuse the, psychi- the pharmaceutical firms of, wow. of expanding uh, the diagnoses, which I actually think has some truth in it because pharmaceutical companies have been very, very aggressive in marketing their products, overly aggressive. But that doesn't mean that this disorder isn't real. And it can be so hard for a parent in this situation when you're coping with a child who's getting in trouble and failing in school. And then you have people telling you that you caused it with your bad parenting and the kids just uh, badly behaved and you should be trying harder and the child should be trying harder because that just puts more blame and stigma on parents who are already struggling. And it might it, it, it might prevent you from actually getting treatment and help that, that you need if all you're hearing is... This, this isn't real. So the first myth I, I hear you shout out is really dangerous. I love that you use the word dangerous, is that ADHD doesn't exist. And the truth is, it does exist. And it is, is a diagnosable um, condition. You use the word condition, syndrome. Both of those things okay. would apply. Okay. And impairment, because to have a diagnosis for ADHD, you have to be impaired, meaning that you're doing badly in two, at least two domains of your life, school and home, for instance, which is very common with a lot of children who have it. Okay. So myth number two. Myth number two is that parents cause it. See, and that's also dangerous because the parents are already in a very stressful situation usually. uh, Most parents aren't up to speed on exactly what they can do or how to approach this. And then they hear that it's all their fault and they blame themselves and it's, it's very interesting, I mean, and very sad that already ADHD is associated with higher incidence of child abuse and violence against mm-hmm. children. And one thing I find extremely interesting that I just reported on is that there's this whole mythology that France doesn't have ADHD, French kids don't have ADHD because they're so well behaved. And in fact, French rates of ADHD, if you look at the research, are similar to rates all over the world. One interesting thing is that the French tolerate a lot more slapping and spanking Uh, than many other countries. That is very interesting what you brought up. I remember growing up a family friend who um, had a child around uh, my age, and no one used this term, ADHD, back then. But I always felt as a child that this boy was naughty. Um, and, and that his father especially was very loud and very aggressive in his discipline of this child. And it was like, as a kid kind of viewing this, I wasn't quite sure which, which caused what, but, um, I'm, what I'm hearing now is that a lot of this misbehavior is out of the child's control. And when parents get their buttons pushed, they are now not parenting as their best selves. Of course. And don't get me wrong. ADHD, kids with ADHD need limits just like any kids do. They need limits, but they also need love and warmth. And the best style of parenting would be to combine both of those things. I guess my point here is that parents with children with ADHD are under a lot more stress than other parents. And so they are a lot more prone to lose it. And that can aggravate a cycle in which the child with ADHD 
has low self-esteem, has post-traumatic stress syndrome, and you're just complicating a difficult situation. Okay, so it does exist, and parents are not to blame, and the third myth? The third myth is that only boys have it, that this is a disorder of boys. Right now, an astounding number of American boys has it. It's like one out of five that are that are being diagnosed. And girls are diagnosed at a lower rate still, and but but at a higher rate than past years because we have gotten more aware. But I am an example of a girl who slipped under the radar because ADHD manifests differently in girls and boys. Girls are socialized to cooperate more and to behave not more nicely. So boys more often get in trouble because of their impulsivity and distraction. And so they get the diagnosis and treatment. Steve Hinshaw, my collaborator on this book, ADHD, What Everyone Needs to Know, has done amazing research on girls, longitudinal research following them through their lifespan and finding out that for girls, if they have undiagnosed ADHD, they're much more likely to be suicidal, to have eating disorders, to self-harm, Girls um, end up with a lot of anxiety and depression, even when it is treated. But when it's not treated, it's really a burden for girls. So if you're the parent of a daughter versus a son, um, you may not be hearing from the school that your That's kid your kid is point. misbehaving. So right. um, now when you talk about girls being anxious and uh, falling into depression, um, this is something that anyone who deals with teen girls knows is a prevalent kind of um, descriptor. So let's take a 10-year-old girl, prepubescent, and um, she seems to be doing fine in school. What are the signs that she might, in fact, um, have ADHD? Well, if she seems to be doing well in school, meaning Mm -hmm. that she's getting her homework in on time, Mm -hmm. um, living up to her potential academically, and has friends, I don't think you should worry. Okay. But if this girl is losing her homework, forgetting things, and I think more importantly, if she's losing her friends around the age of 9 or 10, which is when Mm -hmm. these problems really manifest, Mm -hmm. the parent really should be on it. Because... I think probably one of the most serious problems with ADHD is that it does affect your social relationships. Kids with ADHD are more annoying, intrusive, maybe break their promises and aren't that trustworthy versus other kids just because they're more impulsive. So around that age, when the social situation gets more challenging, kids with ADHD often find themselves without friends. And to be without friends is a very serious problem. Yeah. I mean, at any age, middle school, probably, uh, especially. One thing that I read in your book that really jumped out at me was um, a finding that kids with ADHD may tease a friend more aggressively across a line. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, there's an interesting thing that happens with kids with ADHD. It's kind of a hyper focus is one of the terms for it or perseverating, being insistent on something. My wonderful son, when he was nine or 10, used to bug me about the fact that he wanted a wallaby. I mean, it was the most crazy. A wallaby? A wallaby, an Australian wallaby. <laughs> okay. He got into his head. Gee, mom, it's, it's a reasonable request. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- there were things like that, which makes life with the child with ADHD very so interesting. So he was bugging you about this pet. He was, he, the, this son of mine is the most creative, intelligent, lovable boy in the world. He could be very annoying. Uh-huh. And he he would perseverate. He would insist. And I, at, you know, at first I was just like very mild mannered and said, <laughs> you know, I don't think that the health authorities <laughs> here would allow us to have a wallaby or it might be really hard to get one shipped from Australia. And we looked at what pictures of wallabies. It? <laughs> <laughs> but after a while, I just kind of, you know, that's enough with the wallabies. And <laughs> kids will do this to each other and it's really unfortunate and the a really important part of being a parent with a, a of a child with ADHD I think is to help them understand their effect on you and their effect on kids their age and to help them find different ways of of, of relating to people this is all really important information and I be, I'm now segueing segueing into this idea that I also picked up from your book and also um from 
from what you just said before is that when you first started doing research for your son, you found that you were undiagnosed with ADHD yourself. So how prevalent is this connection between um, the parent and child in terms of this particular condition? It's super prevalent. And it's a really important thing to know that ADHD is very strongly hereditary. It's almost as hereditary as height in families. Wow. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So if you have a child with ADHD, look to yourself or your spouse. And really, it's important to get treated, get understood, because as in my case, it could be creating a lot of conflict. You're trying to help a child get organized and you're not that organized yourself Mm -hmm. or you're getting into more conflicts because part of the deal with ADHD is that you've got basically a sleepy brain and you're trying to wake it up and you might be trying to wake it up with worrying or picking fights. And that can be very difficult for a family. I'm sure. And if you've got a kid who's pushing your buttons about wallabies or whatever, um, (laughs) it might be particularly challenging for you as a parent with ADHD to deal with it in in a helpful way. Exactly. And so it's really important to get support. I will just go back to the fact that the step number one is to get educated. And there's many ways to get educated. And don't fall into the uh, problem of trusting everything that you see on the internet, because anything with a dot com after it is trying to sell you something. Mm. So when you're on the internet, look for dot edu, look for the wonderful advice that you can get from the National Institutes of Health and, or and other credible sources. Uh, Steve Hinshaw and I really aim to write the most credible book. Neither one of us is taking any money from the drug industry or anybody else involved with this. So look to sources of information that you can trust and really understand this because you're going to have to be advocating for your child and for yourself. This is all great information. I'm really appreciative of all of the research that you've done over the years and particularly this book because it's small, it's concise, it's not threatening in any way and um, it's a really good read for anybody, (laughs) anyone who wants to be more educated. And I think a lot of us... um, are curious, even if I say, you know, we may not be directly impacted. Um, there, are, there are people that we interact with, and sometimes we just don't understand their behavior. Right, right. And it helps to have some compassion. Oh, I absolutely. Mean, so, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, we only have a minute left, Catherine. I'm wondering if we could uh, use this time for you to give our viewers and listeners an opportunity to find out where they can learn more about the book and your work. Thank you so much, Annie. They can turn tune into my website, which is katherineillison.com. And also they can join the Facebook page for Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention, which is the memoir I wrote about my son and myself. Great book. I've, I've got a I've got a live thank you. I've got a lively discussion going on, on the on the Facebook page. Wonderful. Thanks again for your time, Catherine. And um yeah, if we get some posted comments here, I hope that you revisit the podcast page and, and maybe you can um, help some parents out that way as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. To learn more about my work with parents of tweens and teens, visit AnnieFox.com. And check out my parenting book, Teaching Kids to Be Good People. And my latest book for tween girls, the girls' Q&A book on friendship, 50 ways to fix a friendship without the drama. And if you like this podcast, we ask that you review it on iTunes. It may be a little thing to you, but it means an awful lot to us. Family Confidential Podcast is produced by Electric Egg Plant, creators of books and apps for parents, kids, tweens, and teens. And tune in next time when my guest will be marriage and family therapist and teen author Matt Casper. Matt and I will be talking about the role of young adult fiction in the social and emotional development of teens. Until next time, happy parenting.